Cool. Can everybody hear me? Okay. You guys? All right. Sweet. Um, so my name is Jessica Lucci. Um, I'm an SRE at DevOps or at GitHub. Not DevOps. Cool. Um, okay. So I work on the SRE delivery team. And what that team does is we essentially own everything after you hit the deploy button. Um, so we don't own the CI builds, but we do own all the deploy mechanisms and we run the Kubernetes cluster that everything does run on. So all of GitHub.com runs on Kubernetes. Um, and that's like a fairly recent thing. Uh, we announced or talked about it a lot at this previous KubeCon. Um, but we are the team that own it. Um, so that's kind of my spiel. Um, and then today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I transitioned to SRE. So uh, I think it's a good time to go to that first history of uh, ops at GitHub. So uh, before the was SRE, uh, I had an ops team. And it was very much what you would think of in the sense of like traditional operation. So uh, that team owned everything that was Puppet. So all of our servers, all of our applications, everything was Puppet. And there was one team that owned that. And if you wanted to make a change to open an issue with somebody from ops when they had time, would go in and make that puppet change for you and deploy it. Uh, so it was a very slow process. Uh, but it did mean that application developers didn't have to know how to do puppet things. Uh, so there was some pros to it. Uh, the team also handled all of the server requests. So before we had our own data centers, um, this was we were using a physical servers at other places. So this would be like, hey, ops team, I need to have a server application. And like ops would get on the phone with Rackspace and be like, hey, can you throw five more boxes on that rack? Thanks. Uh, so it was also a very slow process. Uh, one of the things that we did do, though, that I think helped us a lot in the long run is we hired, um, develop, we hired people that had some development experience onto the ops team. So some people who had done um, you know, some software development before, not just strictly like I'm writing configuration doing bash kind of stuff. Um, and that helped a lot with the transition to SRE. Um, and then the other uh, main responsibility that the operations team had to have was that they did everything that was on call. So that was if an application page, if the infrastructure page, everything went to ops. Uh, and there was only one level of paging. So everything was a wake up the human alert. Uh, which you can imagine was not like super fun for everyone. <laughs> uh, so th this is kind of how Ops started out, and it was okay. It was a very small company. It, it worked with them. It offloaded responsibilities onto certain people. Um, but then GitHub started growing a lot, and this became untenable really quickly. And then uh, when we started transitioning to an SRE team, and yeah, so the first thing when we decided that we wanted to transition to SRE was that we actually wanted to define what SRE was and what it meant to us. And we defined that um, in terms of everybody's favorite buzzword, uh, culture. Kind of what, what is the mindset of this team? What are the things that they care about? How do they operate? And then we also define uh, the implementation of that SRE team. So specifically, how do we approach these engineering problems? What kind of things are we developing? What do we care about? Uh, and so a question that I get a lot when I talk about um, like how GitHub has their own SRE manifesto is like, why would you do that in the first place? Because uh, we, we made this transition after Google had their you know, SRE compiler that came out. And so there's a lot of questions around like, well, there's already this uh, accepted definition. Why would you go and redefine your own thing? And I think one of the, there, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of the most important ones was that we have a very different model than Google does. Um, some companies are really focused on uh, quick, explosive growth and really generating income, where uh, larger, more established companies are less concerned with that, uh, have more sophisticated and are happy uh, the time to focus more on reliability efforts. Uh, so it, uh, depending on kind of where you fall in that camp really defines the amount of engineering risk that you're willing to take on. And defines a lot of uh, how how reliable are you going to uh, let your SREs make things. Um, additionally, I think you know, we're all snowflakes, both people and companies. Uh, so we had uh, specific needs that, like where, where GitHub was at that time, uh, the problems that we were trying to solve, the infrastructure that we already had, uh, where we wanted to get to, but 
we had to define like the path there. Um, and that path is different for everybody. Uh, there's a whole lot of factors that go into that. And then one of the other really important things that we did was this publishing of our like manifesto internally as a public service announcement to the company. Um, Cause it turns out if you change your from ops to SR, don't stop um, making puppet PRs and asking you to spin up servers. Crazy, I know. <laughs> um, but unless, unless we had really like concretely defined what this team's mission was and the things that they are going to be working on, it was going to be like business as usual. Nothing would have changed or would have had a different name. Uh, and so those are uh, a couple of the reasons why we, why we did this. Um, so I'm going to briefly cover our, the, I don't want to call it manifesto, I can't think of a better word, <laughs> um, our like philosophy. Specific to us and where we wanted to go as a company and how we wanted to grow. Um, but I don't think that that means that they're not relevant to other people. I think a lot of these are pretty general and apply to a lot of people, which is why I wanted to share this. Um, so the first thing that we uh, defined in our culture was that something that we was important to SRE was enabling shipping. So this is actually what our company core values, and this kind of falls into that camp of explosive growth. We want to grow really fast. We want to iterate often, um, and so in order to do that, you have to be able to grow often. And so making that a top priority was something that we really wanted to ingrain in the SRE team. Uh, clean and organized work. So a lot of um, SRE, SRE a lot of collaboration with other teams, I think more so than a lot of other um, eng orgs. And part of that is that uh, we have a lot of information that we disseminate to other, um, other teams in the org and help them, you know, how do I deploy this to Kubernetes? What is Kubernetes? How do you, X, Y, or Z? There's a lot of like domain knowledge that SREs have. And so having a well-organized way to go and discover that information was very important to us. Also, GitHub is an entirely remote company, so most of our communication is text media, so in general, that's a really important feature for us, um, but especially in the sense of for other developers to discover information. Uh, leave it better than you found it, just kind of explanatory. We put a lot of code bases. We didn't want to go around and, like, make it up worse, then nobody would like us. <laughs> design things you'd want to use. Um, I think this is better phrased, like design things that you want to use if you had no context. Uh, so I think a lot of times a mistake we make as ops is that we design tools that work really well for us in ops for the context that we have. So um, one of our examples is we have a lot of uh, CLI tools I can help around managing our code cluster. And it's great because everybody on the we understand what the thing is doing. Um, and then a developer will come in and be like, hey, how do I get the log to my pod? And you're like, oh, yeah, no problem. Just run this, this, this command line tool. It's like, OK, great. Where do I run it? Oh, you have to get on the Bastion server. How do I get there? You need VPN. You know, it's just this waterfall of things that you had all this context around. Like, we've already set this up. So things you would never have thought of. Um, so. That, that's kind of what that uh, culture tries to encompass, like design these things out of no context. And then I think the most important one that we defined here was working as a team. Again, SRE is a lot of um, collaboration. And so uh, well, sorry, what I mean is by working as a team, not working as a team like within SRE, but treating the whole company as your team. Um, because we, we touch so many different code bases and Everybody, everybody deploys their stuff to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, that if we operated in like the SRE silo, uh, we would never get anything done. Um, and nobody would want to do things fast or work with us to make code better. So really treating like the whole company as your team has been a really difficult mindset for us. Then implementation wise, this is the engineering stuff. Um, plan for failure. I think that's a pretty standard SRE idea. Um, things are going to break, so make sure you have a plan if they do. Uh, approach change mindfully. Um, anytime you change a system, it's 
possibility to introduce um, a, a, every, every code base is a potential risk. So when you are going in and making changes, it seems like a small thing. Um, we, we like to take a step back and be like, okay, what is the actual, what is the actual problem that we're solving here? And is this meaningful in that way? Um, yeah, so uh, just a way that we approach problems. Measuring with purpose is super easy to get overload. Like when we, when we set up for me initially, it was like, look at all these things that exports. And then something broke and we're like, okay, we need to find out the DNS resolution time. And we had thousands of metrics and like, now what? <laughs> um, so making sure that when you do measure systems that you're measuring them again, with purpose, like if, if this thing did break, would these be useful? Um, or are these useful in sense of I can tell like how efficiently this thing is running? Don't just dump everything that Datadog gives you onto a dashboard. It's not useful. <laughs> this was a, a huge one, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but avoid alerting humans. Humans don't like waking up in the middle of the night. It's not fun. It doesn't build good team morale. It doesn't um, make people want to work more. So <laughs> really, really make sure that if you are alone wake somebody up it is because your business critical function has failed um, expect capacity changes uh, system requirements change over time so make sure you're not building yourself into a corner degrade gracefully again because you fail, partial failure is better than total failure just make sure you have that backup plan um, persist knowledge and this one goes back to a lot of the collaboration stuff and making sure that you're documenting all the domain knowledge that you have um, there's so much stuff. Uh, I think in SRE, it means that you're uh, a generalist. So you, you have a lot of context about like the history of systems, but also, oh, I know Team X is doing this thing, or I know Y is doing this, and you know how those interact with each other. And um, Team X and Y don't have that same knowledge. So making sure that when you're putting it somewhere that other people can remember it later on. Um, it, it's don't let things become tribal knowledge. I'm actually going to read the definition, but still quite get what they want with that one. Uh, so consider all potential users in building software, especially those on your team. Simple tools that can be reasoned about are preferable to tools that attempt to make hard things easy and magic. So this kind of the, like design things, assuming that nobody has context, but it adds this layer of so if you're building this team to, or you're building this tool to enable the team, like maybe you should talk to that team and see what they can out of that tool, uh, which seems, you know, like an easy concept, but there are so many times we've stepped over that. Uh, and also defining system boundaries. So making it very clear uh, what the limits in standard performance and functionality of each system are. And this is like down the road when somebody requests, you know, 500 extra gigs on a, on a box and you're like, wait a second, we talked about this. Um, yeah, so, so those are kind of the, the bullet points we had. Um, and I'm gonna send this out on my Twitter later, so if you wanna like look back over this, you'll have a chance to. Um, so, oops, remember which way I'm going. Cool, so th that was the first thing we did, is we, we defined this list of expectations where we're defining this is what we as a team are going to do. Um, and so, now that we had done this, we had announced to the org that this is a thing now. We are SRE. This is our name. Uh, the first thing we decided to do was find this one page zero. Uh, so, like I had mentioned before, uh, all of our pages were just one level. So everything woke up people, and every application page and every infrastructure page went to a single team at like ultra high priority. Um, so, uh, because of that, um, the pages were essentially driving our roadmap have the ability to do kind of proactive development. It was, it was all reactive. We had so many pages coming in. All we could do was like try to keep up with them and um, fix things in response to problems. Uh, and so if we didn't do something about that, we were never going to get anywhere. Nothing was ever going to get done. So we had this project called Pager Zero. Um, and some of the first things we did were we split uh, the paging levels into two different levels. Um, yeah, crazy groundbreaking idea uh, where 
sub two is um, it's not going to wake people up. It's more of a warning. We actually have it hooked up. It will automatically open an issue and assign it to whoever's on call. Um, and then they can just kind of look through it whenever they have time. And that's worked really well for us. And then sub two is something in path has broken. Um, it is impacting end users and somebody needs to look at it now. Um, yeah, so we, we don't get very many of those at all anymore. Uh, deploy team is a little bit weird. If deploys are failing, if somebody can't deploy github.com, they can manually page us and that's where we get most of our pages actually. Um, because, you know, like <laughs> you can't deploy the website. That's not great. Uh, so, so we're like a little bit of a like in that sense. But overall, Um, we also introduced something of labels and categorization. So uh, ops does not get every single page now. Um, we apply labels and like, you know, this belongs to this team or this is categorized as an app problem. And so it will go to the general app list, things like that. Um, one of the areas where I think that we uh, kind of failed in this initiative and we're still working on is that when we reassigned the um, github.com feature, the .com team or the people that actually make the website. Um, we didn't do any kind of planning around this. We were just like, okay, you know, if it pages for the app, we're going to label it as a .com page. Uh, it turns out there's like some really blurry lines between SRE and the actual application responsibilities. Um, I'm trying to think of a great example. Uh, yeah, so like if, if um, Again, we get paged on deploys. So we had uh, some timeout problems lately because we're, we're dealing with And it's like, okay, well, if somebody's deploy fails um, and it's a timeout, is it a timeout because something is wrong with Kubernetes? Or is it a timeout because something is wrong with the change that they're pushing? There's a lot of these like, well, which one actually is it? And so um, there's, there's a lot of, in, 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 in that, um, inherited all of the build scripts for every application and we've still been rolling those off but again that's like one of those lines where it's like well i guess we technically own this build script but it's in your repo and you're the ones who do it so why is it paging us and all kinds of stuff and there's not a lot of collaboration right now across those lines so when these things do get paged um, we have not done a great job uh, traditionally uh, A lot of times it's just kind of like, hey, my deploy broke, Boop, over the wall, like, okay, go ahead, uh, do it again. And that doesn't help anybody. Uh, we're using the same page every single time when it's something they could probably fix if we need more context. So uh, the next thing that we did is we got rid of Puppet. Uh, <laughs> uh, we still have some Puppet. It's a but <laughs> to be clear, it's almost gone. Um, so that was one of the other things was we wanted to enable fast shipping. We knew that it was a huge bottleneck for us. It was something we needed to address. Um, so the first thing we did documentation around it. We um, made a decision that said if, if you want to contribute something to Puppet, um, you're going to have to open a PR and make the change yourself. What we're doing will help you do the change. You know, if you have questions about how Puppet works, we're, we're here, we're more than happy to answer those questions for you. Um, but we are intentionally decreasing support to um, encourage people not to use it. Because uh, at the same time, we had rolled out some alternatives to Puppet for management. Um, we're now using Vault for almost everything. And we have a really nice um, tool that sits on top of that that developers can interact with. And so, in that way, we kind of like at the same time, like, you know, hey, here's this really fun, easy to use thing that you don't have to know and write PRs for and you can just you know type three words and bam there it is um, but at the same time still supporting a system uh, so we're, we're still in the process of getting rid of it all together we're, we're pretty close um, but that was one of the, the major things that uh, offload <laughs> and one of the things that um, was really hard to do was like learning how to say no um, I think SREs in general, we like to help people. Like that's kind of part of the roles that you, you're helping other developers. And so it's really hard when somebody's like, hey, can you 
help me do this thing or I want to do it this way to just say you no. Know? Um, and so we had to figure out um, like reject work requests, but productive way, not just a, this isn't our problem, you deal with it kind of way. Um, and so some of the first things that we did was that uh, decided that no, you can't deploy straight to production anymore. Uh, that was a thing that used to happen, by the way. <laughs> Fun fact. Uh, there are conditions in place now, and you're going to. Um, and we worked with the teams to, to roll that out. There, there was some pushback at first because the engineering GitHub has traditionally been everybody is root user and can do whatever they want, um, which was, you know, it was a small company at some point. Like it worked. <laughs> um, but we had to like draw a line in the sand. Um, but we made sure that we did it that was supporting the other teams we explained why we were doing it um, yeah and then additionally with like first responder stuff um, we're getting better and better about not, uh, like if somebody pages us and it's not a like pageable thing we'll ask them to open an issue or if somebody drops a question in the chat room and we're like in the middle of fighting a fire um, you know hey can you file an issue instead just uh, this kind of like uh, fighting the need jerk action to immediately drop what you're doing and help this person, which sounds bad, but like if you're if you're not getting the work on your roadmap done, you're not helping this person in the long run. Uh, so it's like finding a way to balance those two things, and part of that is saying no, I cannot do this for you right now, um, but not shutting them out completely, giving them another avenue. Uh, so after we had done a lot of those things, that helped us. Um, we, we now control our roadmap to decide what we wanted to iterate on. Uh, we you know, can actually do SRT now, which was great. So the next thing we did was we, we narrowed the focus. So now we controlled our roadmap, but we had this huge string of things that we owned. Um, so when we became SRE, um, some people got in a room and decided that uh, we now owned all these projects. And we didn't know that we owned these projects until we started breaking. And people were like, hey, what's going on with, you know, Project X, wait, nobody owns that? Like, what, what? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a big company that happens. And so we inherited a lot of stuff that we didn't even know we inherited. Um, and so we are currently working on durable ownership of repositories, which I think is a super important thing. We're building out a service uh, catalog mechanism right now and finding a way to um, very much document, uh, not individuals, but teams that own different repositories where the lines of responsibilities are. Um, and I think this will help us a lot um, just so that, that that whole like this thing breaking in production, nobody actually owns this. The last person who touched it is on vacation or not at the company anymore. Um, doesn't happen, uh, which I'm sure all of you would appreciate too. Uh, so uh, another thing that we're working on is that uh, some of the projects that we inherited either voluntarily or involuntarily uh, require SRE knowledge to run and develop uh, because they are, they are either in the old ecosystem that we have this historical knowledge around or they are just like back-end heavy applications that nobody really has the expertise to use. And so um, we're trying this idea of um, temporary ownership where we take on that project for a period of time, we bring it to operational maturity, um, and then can at that point uh, sorry, did I put this on the next one? Sorry, I was looking at it. Yeah, okay. So, um, let me back up a second there. I'm going to talk more about the, the temporary ownership on the next slide, uh, which I totally prepared for this talk. And then on this one, we're gonna talk about the inheritance toolkit. Okay, so yeah, we, we take the temporary ownership, but we want to get to a point where we have built something that's like a, an inheritance toolkit is kind of what we're calling it right now. But this um, toolkit uh, or documentation, whatever it includes, that basically enables developers to take on these like SRE heavy or unknown projects and be able to manage them themselves without having to rely on us to get them to that place of operational maturity. Uh, and so we're, we're working on it, but right now we're getting a lot of projects thrown on us that have been abandoned. Um, yeah, and so going back to the when we hand off a project, this is the thing that we're working on. We don't have a great story for it yet, we're working through it. Um, once we have, you know, inherited a project, we've brought it to operational maturity, 
sort of like, okay, it's ready to go. Um, we don't need to run this anymore. Uh, we're trying this kind of like progressive handoff where somebody will work with that team for a period of months and be on like paid recruiting with them and then eventually end it off all together. Um, so far, it's worked pretty well. I don't know what we would do differently yet, but that's still one of the things that we are trying to figure out. Um, but giving projects away is a really great feeling and it definitely helps with like getting your own roadmap work done. Um, so it's something we would like to get better at. Uh, yeah, and then kind of in hand with that, like the whole toolkit idea, one of the main things that we're working on, and I think it's the super central part of SRE in general, is making everything self-service. So some of the really big initiatives that we have done to enable that um, was we have all of our own data centers now. We still host some stuff um, on Rackspace and AWS, but uh, all of github.com runs on our own data centers. And so that enabled us to build self where instead of somebody being like, hey, ops, can I get a server? Um, they can type uh, a chat command. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if you know this, but GitHub, all of our tooling is Slack uh, integrations. And we have this, this tool called Qbot, and you ask Qbot to go and do things for you. So you can go, Qbot, I need a server with you know, X amount of memory, or this or that, and he'll be like, all right, on it. Um, and then you have a server. <laughs> so. It's, uh, it's, it's awesome and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> um, okay. uh, it's worked really well so far, though. Um, yeah, so uh, being able to build a tool for users that already knew how to interact with this Hubot interface, well, now they could just um, add an additional command that would give them a server when they needed it. And so that was like a really big push there. Another one was the Kubernetes migration that we just recently finished up. Um, and so that, that changed a lot of things for us. A lot of that was like developer-owned config. So developers own their Kubernetes config. They live in repo with their projects. And so the developer defines what their project looks like, what resources it needs, and it needs to deploy it. Um, yeah, and so it, they also don't need, like there is no interaction with SRE at all to create and deploy an application to production. Um, we have a chat tool that says, scaffold me a new project, it'll make you with um, the right configs, you drop your right directory for configs, you drop your configs in those directories, um, you type dot, dot deploy my thing to you know, this cluster, this cluster, and it's up. Uh, and so we are acting very much as a consulting role in there, um, and we, not, we have removed ourselves as a bottleneck, which was a really big step for us. Um, so continuing efforts on that front is we're still we're still learning how to um, build products for teams, not tools. And that is, is back to the, uh, we have traditionally been really good at building tools reactively that help us cope with things. Uh, so like we have this thing called a uh, node problem feeler that can detect issues with Kubernetes nodes and restart them proactively. Um, and that's great, but when a developer is like, hey, my pod isn't working and they don't have the tool to be like, um, you know, Qbot, my pod isn't working, go do something. Qbot doesn't, you know, go and like see if the code is broken and run the healer on it, right? It's a tool that we have written that technically a developer could use and they could restart the code and everything would be fine, but there's no way they're getting from point A to B. Um, and so if we had built a product like an integration to that chat interface that allowed them to do that, that would have been a lot more useful um, for both sides. So that is a thing that we are working on. And doing um, more design where we're taking into account what, um, like, again, what, what context does the user have? Who is the actual person who's going to be using it? What do they need out of it? Um, and then we've also been improving our story around metrics and monitoring. Um, we have data dog for everything. So much data dog. Um, and so recently we started um, deploying Prometheus to all of our instances. So that was like a little bit epic that we did. Um, but we really are working on collecting more data around our Kubernetes clusters, but in a way that is meaningful. So again, like not just dumping everything that we possibly have and like, hey, we might need this, but um, taking a minute and think like, what defines the health of a cluster, right? Um, for, for us at GitHub anyway, like, is it are all the API nodes up, um, you know, X amount, X percent of the nodes are up. This 
in response to this amount of time, X amount of percent of deployment succeeds. Like there's so many different variables and factors in there. We're really like um, zoning in on what we care about and what different terms of health mean to us. And so um, by doing that, we are, uh, the reason that I put this under health service is that as we are doing that, we are exposing all so somebody, again, who knows my app isn't working, can go to a page where they can see the Kubernetes cluster it's running on is acting up. So it's this layer of, hey, you can self-diagnose these. Um, and this, this also includes um, application monitoring, so pulling uh, different metrics out of their applications so they can see the place of the app or the cluster, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's something that we have a lot of it in place, but it's not yet because we have it narrowed it down to the things that actually matter. It's a, a giant splatter, um, but anything you want to find, so I guess there's that. Um, and then the last piece that um, we have been working through is, is collaboration in general. So um, the culture at GitHub before was that there was this um, bubble between ops and the rest of the company. Ops was a bubble um, for a thing it over the wall and you know a couple days later hey i have a server um we don't want that um so we have like talked with other teams something that comes up is that there's a lot of um throw it over the wall mentality because developers um are assuming that this this is too complicated i don't understand how this thing works like um sre help me like do this for me uh and the thing is that uh, i think Developers are just as smart as people in ops are. I think that there's like this uh, risk a lot that we tend not to give people benefit of the doubt. And it's not that anybody is smarter than anybody else. It's just that there's a like context difference. Like, um, you know, somebody has worked in uh, JavaScript their entire career and then is asked to um, go and find the logs from their Kubernetes pod. Like, that's a pretty mind shift. And so we're trying to bridge that gap by by filling in those empty pieces of context and, and not just like doing things for developers, but having them with us while we do that thing so that they can learn and understand what's happening. So the next time it comes around, um, maybe they can help somebody else on their team do it um, or point them to the documentation for that problem, like that kind of stuff. Um, and I think that that we're still working on it, but it's, it's really helping building those relationships with other teams. Um, and you know, the more people understand, the less they're going to ask you to do the like, you know, way you're making your job easier. Uh, and then also exposing tribal knowledge. And that goes on. We have a lot of historical data about, uh, or information about uh, what the systems at GitHub look like and why they look like that. And again, we have a really great picture of how all these pieces interact with one another. Um, that people who work on other teams do not have. So um, really focusing on exposing that through documentation and those kind of things where we like sit down with teams and walk them through you know, the problem X or Y has been helping a lot. Um, explaining the whys and the hows. Again, that's the don't just solve the problem, but explain what the problem was, how you solved it, why it was a problem, really walking through all of that. Um, and then the last piece that we're putting a lot of effort into right now is defining um, SLIs and SLOs. Uh, we don't, <laughs> we haven't, so uh, for, for anybody who is not familiar or has a different definition um, than us, I guess, SLIs are, are um, simple metrics we're checking. So that would be like, what is the latency between these servers? And SLO is an objective, something that we want to achieve. So like, you know, um, the 90% of requests uh, finish within you know, two milliseconds between these two servers. And then uh, an SLA for us is like, uh, this is a customer facing thing where if you define an SLA, um, and they break it. Like you are contractually obligated to compensate the other person in some way. Uh, so we have not defined a lot of those yet. Uh, we're really working on building up those SLOs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. So building those so that uh, so, so that developers who are coming onto our systems or want to use our tools have an idea of what to expect performance-wise. So they know what their application needs. 
and um, they should be able to find out if the thing that we are running can support their needs for their application. Um, and this, this ties a lot to health of the system as well, so letting developers know whether or not our clusters are healthy. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're currently working through as well. Yeah, and so that's um, all I have. Um, I wanted to leave uh, time for questions and like talking through stuff because uh, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that we in our, our journey have not figured out yet. So um, not like using y'all as a mind farm or something, but <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I like the idea of having a conversation about it. Uh, so yeah, if anybody has questions or suggestions or anything, feel free to fire away. Uh, I'm curious about something. And idea of an operations team and two uh, if not why the wholesale transition to SRE instead of SRE as the target for improvement collaboration team and a more traditional operations operations team sure um so for the first question uh do we have an operations team still we do not um we have uh, our SRE that are, I think, some more similar to traditional operations. So we have an SRE data center team that does a lot of the like, I am going to by hand put this server into this rack and do this thing. And um, we also have an SRE lifecycle team and they deal a lot with um, basically all of the not Kubernetes infrastructure, but that they have traditionally provisioned in, in an ops manner. So Puppet and um, uh, other things that are escaping me at the moment. Uh, and then, so no, and then the second question, um, why did we decide not to have an ops team at all? Why, why did we jump ship entirely to SRE? Um, that was a lot of the, the culture um, idea of what we wanted to exemplify. So uh, to us, ops meant kind of like um, annual task and labor um, kind of uh, approach to things. And so while we still have like some traditional operations work, we wanted to make sure that it was done with all of those goals in mind of like automating things, making them faster, um, making them more reliable, etc. Uh, so we wanted to like apply the same standards uh, to, to any ops work that we were doing. And so it kind of made sense just to suck that under SRE. Um, does that answer the second question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, again, like, I think it's, I, I think there's some, some well-defined lines of SRE, but I also feel like SRE is very much a, a spectrum, um, that is like, as you need it per company. And so for us, we felt like, let's automate all the things side. So uh, if I understood this correctly, you're an entirely a remote workforce at uh, GitHub. Uh, so can you talk at all about especially in terms of the, the prior, the black box as, aspect of over the wall with ops, how much of that was made better or worse both before and after in terms of being entirely remote and people being, um, you know, a Google Hangouts picture or, 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 or Slack handle and how much of that, uh, 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 yeah, anything you talk about that would be great. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to say it was, it was difficult, like, it was, uh, as somebody who works remotely, like being able to send this off into the ether and it comes back done is like very compelling. Um, but we have, <laughs> we, we have put a lot of work in what remote culture looks like. So outside of like engineering entirely, just the remote work culture of GitHub, um, we have put a lot of effort into um, like, I'm trying to think of a word that's not brainwashing. Um, but, like, <laughs> Instilling the beliefs in our employees. <laughs> um, yes, that one. Um, but like, uh, really, really, the values of because we are remote, we have to focus extra hard on collaborating. Um, so we do a lot of like we have many summits where we meet up every year. Um, or sorry, we have summits where the entire org meets up. We have many summits where um, individuals meet up. Then we have um, semi-mini summits where like an org will meet up um, and 
yeah, we have all these different mechanisms for collaborating. And so um, the idea of shifting away from the black box and into a more collaborative relationship um, was something that the company wanted to support. And so um, I feel like there was a lot of it sucks, but I understand and I'm willing to try. Um, there's, there's a lot of really great people who work at GitHub. Um, and I think like they, there's a lot of uh, work that goes into the hiring process to try and make sure that um, people who come on are willing to have that mentality. And so I think that helped a lot. Um, but it, it has been a progressively easy process. Uh, and I think now that we're at the point where um, it's not a black box, people are like really interested in the, the workings underneath it and actually want to like, hey, you know, like how, how do I get this public amount so, you know, like Docker has a limit on um, how much data I can store in this room. So, you know, like just really getting into the guts of it. And it's really cool that we get to be there and act as consultants when they're like figuring stuff out for us too. Uh, so, uh, it took a while, but it's, it's in a good place now. <laughs> so, quick kind of, uh, you transition away from Puppet. Uh, I'm just curious, like, uh, was there like an interim period there which uh, was where it kept alive for a while? And uh, secondly, what was the easy answer? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, first question uh, what was the transition away from Puppet like? Uh, we, we still use Puppet for some things, so we're not 100% there. Um, but what, what we did with that transition was we, we put those easy alternatives in place, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but at the same time, we were uh, decreasing support for Puppet. So it was like a, um, the alternatives in place solved the problems that Puppet needed to solve for us. So from a purely functional standpoint, the transition was actually pretty easy. Um, from a people and mindset transition, that was a little more difficult because it was like, hey, this is the way I've always done things. I'm really comfortable with this process. Um, getting people to accept change is not always easy. Uh, so this like um, explaining why we were transitioning and, and letting people under, like, getting them to understand why this is a good thing. And then creating lots of support for the new stuff and decreasing support for the old stuff um, was kind of incentivized to, to switch over. Um, and then we did have a, a hard cut in place for like, um, for almost everything. Again, there's still some stuff that couldn't be switched yet, but like, hey, by this date, like we will no longer sort from disk kind of thing. Um, and so that was uh, an extra incentive to switch. Uh, <laughs> most everybody had switched by that point though. So um, again, everybody's pretty on board. <laughs> um, and then secondarily, what were the easy alternatives? Um, we had built an internal solution called Tweaker initially, um, which I still have thoughts about. Um, but it, was, uh, it was really easy. We built um, a, a command line interface to it um, that essentially if you were part of that team, you could make change sequence there. And, um, the deploy team, our, our deploy mechanism, uh, will automatically grab secrets and inject um, And so we had built that kind of pre-dawn uh, of HashiCorp. And so uh, now that Vault is a thing and it's really reasonable that it is, um, like it, it checks all of our boxes, we are almost completely done transitioning to that. Uh, because it, if somebody is like, their company is building this thing to secure and reliable, love open source. I mean, it's not, but like, we love using other people's code and not having to like do that thing ourselves. Open source is great, y'all. Um, so we're switching over to that. But what we're doing this round is we're still giving people the chance of automatically doing it. Um, but we're actually building a tool that if you don't need, if you haven't transitioned by that cutoff date, we're going to auto do it for you. Um, and I think that that it's going to work really well because we still have that hard cutoff data, but it's, we're going to make it happen, but we're also making it happen. So yeah, I, I feel like it's a, it's a good medium. Yeah. Is there anywhere transition to like that? Now this is just not worth it. Um, 
I don't know that I would say outright failed. There has definitely been failures and turning points. Um, so like with, with the um, dot com page of stuff, like that's something that's fresh for me right now as I have just come off rotation. <laughs> um, but like super frustrating and not something we have a great solution for. Um, but it's, it's not like what was before was so much worse than what is now. Um, I think the, the one place where maybe like SRE failed is an appropriate term was um, our lifecycle team are the ones who kind of inherited all the, the non-new shiny Kubernetes things. Um, I forget, they had a different name before. They were SRE something. <laughs> um, oh, this is bad. Uh, they, they were, they were a, some SRE function before and they had a different goal and it just ended up not working out at all. Um, in terms of like company culture and what we were trying to accomplish. And so but that like, they shifted within SRE, so it was still SRE, but like a completely different like goal of this team or um, initiatives. I just got back from their mini summit. They just like redefined their mission kind of thing. Um, and so that's not like a whole lot of context around the transition. Uh, yeah, there's, there's never been a point where we were like, man, I wish we still had ops. I'm sure to the other developers, there are like lots of those moments. Um, but to us personally, it has, it has been a like net positive move. Yeah. Quick question. Uh, you mentioned about monitoring metrics that matter. I totally agree, I understand. But generally the, the culture, a lot of people do like, let's monitor all the things. So um, people don't understand the amount of effort it is to store, manage, and maintain all of that. What, how do you go about, like when you say, when you go about monitoring metrics that matter, did you turn off other things that you've been monitoring in the past? And how do you go about like getting teams to agree to that? And it's a cultural shift because everybody wants to monitor everything. It <laughs> does come in at certain times, but if you take the overall times it's been used, it's almost minimal. It's just collecting data for the sake of collecting the way I see it. Yeah, it's, it's not a super easy problem. So um, make sure I rephrase the question. So um, how, how do we, like, a, uh, when we have decided that a metric is not like a super important thing, what do we do with it? Do we offload it? How do we store it? And then how do we get other teams to kind of shift into that mindset and like, be okay and feel safe that some of their metrics are not safe somewhere. Um, so for the first part of that, uh, we are um, currently kind of redoing the facility, so it's an influx progress, uh, but right now we dump everything in Datadog. <laughs> um, that is our go-to, and then uh, we serve things through dashboards. Uh, what we are doing with Prometheus, um, and right now we're only using Prometheus if we do intend to use it for other systems. Um, but Prometheus has retention periods, um, which is great for uh, like, okay, what if something goes terribly wrong over the weekend and we come in on Monday and what happens if we just dropped all that data? Um, so instead we have a retention period for like the, the giant chunk of data, but we only export and persist um, rolled up or aggregated metrics that we care about to Datadog. Uh, so I think, I'm trying to give an example, um, so a uh, metric we care about is like the um, different quantile latency for um, requests from an API server to a node. Uh, so that's something we, we care about. And, but we don't care about like each individual request that it makes and what the latency of the request was. So we'll aggregation on Prometheus, roll it out to Datadog, and then store that. And we'll keep those little ones for, um, we're, we're still adjusting what time period we're uh, But then, um, we just drop them all together. Uh, and so it, uh, it works because a lot of the times when you need those like little offshoots is when something bad is happening. Uh, so we are still dumping everything into Datadog, so we still have like our safety net, but we are moving towards that. We're doing a lot of pre-processing, storing, and then dumping. Um, in terms of getting other teams like on board with it, uh, we, we're um, the service catalog thing that we're building out. Um, we're, we're implementing this idea of like uh, importance of applications, so, or like ratings of applications and how you get to like a higher rating 
So a higher rating means you have more resources, more support from SRE and how you get to those higher ratings is that you tick off certain checkboxes. Um, and so some of those checkboxes are going to be things like, uh, you know, are you doing these metrics this way? Uh, but you're building the tools so that they don't have to implement it. Um, yeah, I, uh, we haven't gotten quite to the point where we're like trying to keep people away from Datadog and the application level metrics. So we haven't run into that, like, what are you doing to me? Um, but I have a feeling that if you like continue, here's the, the carrot, here's the stick kind of thing, <laughs> um, it'll be okay. I, I don't have a better answer for that part, yeah. Um, I'm very curious about, I don't know what the first thing that happened chronologically in your slides, but my fifth was like the, the your manifesto thing. How long was it from the beginning of the process really to build it to now from everything puppet and, and ranking servers to what, how you are today? Yeah, so um, question being, how, how long was the transition from the point where we were like, not good, we need to do something about this to where we are today. Um, and the answer is that it was a very short period of time. Our Kubernetes work started um, all, like July of last year. So we're like a year. So like, uh, all right, that, that is GitHub's, uh, one of our metallics passed. And so we're like, this is awful. This is not sustainable. Let's go fix this. And um, we built the Kubernetes platform. So that one happened really quickly. Um, the Puppet stuff happened in tandem with that because a lot of Kubernetes um, enabled us to functionality that was necessary to Kubernetes. Um, and then with a lot of the data center stuff, that's, that's been going on for a, a couple of years. We're still building that story. Like we're still building out data centers and um, different like uh, uh, points of presence over in Europe and stuff like that. Um, so that, that has probably been the most like, the ongoing process. Um, but the SRE document, let me actually find the date on the manifesto for you. Um, is it, I don't know if somebody like has another question while I look this up too. Does that, no. not good at questions, sorry. <laughs> Was, oh, sorry, real quick. Um, yeah, so the, First draft was um, two years ago, and then the last update was about a year and a half ago. So I think that's about the time we started doing the data centers. So that's timeline. So I had a question about some of the metrics you're collecting and what you're bubbling up on your dashboard. Is that more about the application side metrics or just like completely like more lower level? Or do you guys differentiate between the two? Yeah. So. Um, how involved are we with application metrics versus like the infrastructure metrics? Differentiate between the two. How um, we are involved with application metrics currently in the sense that we have provided tools for people to automatically export logs. So um, if if your if your container writes to standard out, that log will eventually find its way into Splunk, which will eventually find its way into data. like we have all those routes in place, so that once you deploy an application, boom, you have logs. Um, but we don't control what people are printing out or you know, um, what formats or things like that. Uh, so we don't have control of the application logging in that way. Um, but we, when we are switched to kind of the service catalog and like, what grade is your application? Um, hope to kind of put some more uh, structure around that. Again, the culture at GitHub has traditionally been everybody here, you do what you want, like this is your application. And so it's kind of counter to what has been there before, but we haven't thought it's necessary, so it'll be a slow process, but it is something we're like starting to uh, you know, put out there. Well, I find this super interesting because I feel like our companies are coming at like same destination on like opposite spectrum. Mm -hmm. You guys had a separated application ops team where we've had like a mixed team. So when we're starting to collect metrics, we're thinking about like which application endpoints are the most key critical to the application. Just want to start bubbling those up. Say like um, like a curation queue that's super important to managing certain content. That starts bubbling up. We just we just care about those kind of metrics, not like um, 
latency of the overall service. So I'm wondering like if your endpoint is somewhere similar to that. Um, almost. So we're, we're definitely going to have a set of uh, your application that's exposed these base metrics so we know how it's performing. Um, because you know, if, something gets, if we get paid for something from infrastructure, we need to be able to go and see um, whether or not it is the app or the, the box. And we also want to impose like a standard of quality across the applications. Um, but there, there are going to be app, um, logging and metrics that are super specific to applications that like just don't need to have anything to do with. Um, so it, it's, it's more so around like putting those have to have X, Y, and Z in place um, so that we can guarantee like overall quality GitHub. Um, Cause it, like, yeah, if you like let people go off and do their thing in a corner, like, you know, GitHub's great and then you try to like click a checkbox and then, you know, you gotta wait 15 seconds or something, um, trying to kind of avoid that disparity. Yeah. So uh, you brought up metrics and only exporting aggregates to Datadog. That made me think one of, as somebody who's worked on traditional opt-in for a while, there's a lot of integration and collaboration with security that needs to happen depending on your environment. And so how, how does the security team work with the relation to SRE? Uh, sure, so um, how, how does security work uh, in a couple of different ways? So all of the like PII information, so all of people's identity stuff, um, we never see or touch uh, completely like in a black box world. Um, so we don't have any control over that. Um, what we do have is we work with them to develop standards for doing certain things. So right now um, I'm working on a, a feature that will let, um, we, we, uh, let developers uh, click of a button, expose their applications outside of our VPN, which has all kinds of like potential consequences. And so I um, have been working with them to like literally develop a checklist for um, a developer who wants to do this, 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 this issue, um, you know, SecOps will approve it and then we can do our automated process. Uh, so a lot of it has been like front loading approval work to them and then implementing. Um, but we, it, uh, collaborate a lot with them whenever it comes to um, essentially anything that's not within the VPN. Um, yeah, they're pretty chill. One more question for Jessica. And I'll be here afterwards too, and I have an email and stuff. So, all right then. Thank you very much, Jessica Lucci. Thank you.